Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, welcome to another in uh, the webinar series of the Migration and Food Network. My name is John Abraham. I am the Academic Dean at United College at the University of Waterloo. And it is my great pleasure to introduce to you today, uh, Professor Chetan Choitani from the National Institute of Advanced Studies in Bangalore, India, who will be presenting to us uh, migration, food security, and development insights from rural India. Uh, just a few words of uh, introduction will follow, um, but our format for today will be that Dr. Ch uh, Chaitani will present for about half an hour. If at any time during the presentation you have any questions, I would ask you all to please drop your questions in the chat function. I will be moderating the questions. Um, and after the presentation, there will be about 20 minutes for Q&A. So either during the presentation so that you don't forget or during the Q&A uh, period, if you could please put your questions in the chat function, I will then moderate and uh, communicate those uh, questions to uh, Dr. Choitani. Uh, a few words of introduction. Um, professor Chetan Choitani is assistant professor in the Inequality and Human Development Program of the School of Social Sciences at the National Institute of Advanced Sciences. Uh, prior to his um, appointment at NIA NIAS, he was a postdoctoral researcher at the Urban Studies Institute of the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies at Georgia State University. Uh, Professor Chaitani obtained his PhD in Geography from the University of Sydney in 2016. Uh, where he was a recipient of the prestigious uh, Prime Minister Postgraduate Award. Uh, prior to his PhD, he completed graduate uh, degrees from the International Institute of Population Studies, as well as the Tata Institute of Social Sciences. The broad disciplinary domain of Dr. Chortani's work is development studies, um, but it includes several cross-cutting themes uh, and his research and teaching interests include migration, urbanization, food and nutrition, livelihoods, gender, um, as well as other themes. And he's widely published in uh, peer-reviewed journals, including World Development, the Journal of Peasant Studies, and the Economic and Political Weekly. In today's talk, um, Dr. Shaitani will draw on his recent book, and his uh, extensive uh, field work in remote parts of India uh, to make the following case. In the past few years, the issue of migration and food security has occupied center stage in global development policy and research agendas, but these discussions have usually tended to proceed in silos with little attention devoted to the relationship they bear with each other. So now using primary field-based evidence from rural India, uh, Dr. Choitani will attempt to bridge this divide, going beyond the conventional understanding of the subject that invariably sees migration as a response to food shortages. And in this presentation, he will focus on two central features of migration in India that include circular moves and male-dominated migration. And in the, analysis, in the analysis, he will highlight how these present two other key pathways through which migration and food security, um, and the relationship between migration and food security plays out. He will argue that a consideration of these linkages provides ultimately for a more holistic understanding of migration, uh, food security, and the migration food security nexus. So without any further ado, Professor Choitani, over to you. Thank you, uh, Professor John Abraham. Let me... Uh... Share my screen. Is my uh, presentation up? Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks. Thanks once again, uh, uh, Dr. John Ibrahim, for uh, uh, for a very kind introduction, and uh, thanks to uh, the organizers at um, at Basley School uh, and also My Food uh, Network, especially uh, Maria Jinjong and Professor Jonathan Crush for inviting me uh, for this talk. Um, I follow uh, the work of My Food Network colleagues uh, on migration food security linkages, and I'm very delighted to have this opportunity to share uh, some of my uh, research on on the subject. And um, uh, as 
Dr. Abraham said in this talk, uh, I'll share uh, research that forms part of the uh, book that I published recently with uh, Cambridge University Press on the linkages between migration, food security, and development. Uh, so the key uh, question uh, I engage with uh, is how rural urban migration influences uh, uh, food access or food security among rural households in India and the broad rationale, which was also uh, uh, pointed to by Dr. Abraham is uh, for this research comes from the fact that despite the increased significance of these two issues of migration and food security in global development uh, research and policy agendas in, 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 in the past few years, connections between them uh, haven't uh, adequately been uh, understood. Uh, why that might be the case? What do we know about, uh, about these connections? And can we uh, think of a conceptual framework uh, to, that enables us to understand the connections between migration and food security? And so these are the questions I uh, wish to engage with. Um, drawing on uh, fieldwork uh, from uh, rural India, uh, but I'll try and also situate this talk in the wider uh, global context. Uh, I, I believe that uh, the the village level insights that I that I'm going to share have wider uh, relevance beyond uh, its immediate research context. So, um, so. And just to uh, establish the, you know, briefly the wider significance of uh, of this relationship, uh, you know, as as I you know, as I said before, um, both the issues have emerged as uh, as important themes in in the global um, development policy and uh, and research in 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 the recent past. Um, for example, in two thousand nine, the annual reports of World Bank and UNDP focused on migration. And, and importantly, unlike earlier, migration is now being viewed more positively uh, for development. Recently, the Sustainable Development Goals recognized the positive contribution uh, of migrants and migration and mobility have also, uh, 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 also been included as part of the SDG agenda. On the other hand, um, Following uh, the the food uh, food price uh, spike since two thousand six, uh, two thousand seven, the significance of food security uh, for all as an important development objective has also grown considerably. Um, twenty in twenty twelve, the UN Secretary General launched uh, a zero hum hunger campaign, and again the SDG two uh, envisages eliminating all forms of food insecurity and hunger uh, from the uh, from the pla uh, planet. Uh, uh, however, uh, again, the discussion on these two issues have uh, tended to proceed in, in, in separate silos and uh, Professor Jonathan Crush uh, highlighted this disconnect uh, in, in, in his agenda setting article uh, in uh, over a decade ago. And unfortunately, this divide uh, continues uh, even today, as I, as I uh, point out in, um, uh, in the book that I did in 2023. Um, and the disconnect uh, arises from several uh, biases really uh, inherent in uh, the dominant discourses of so migration discussions focusing invariably uh, more on the issue of international migration and remittances and what they mean for um, the uh, uh, the economic development of uh, uh, economic growth and financial development of developing countries. Uh, food security discourse, on the other hand, tends to focus um, more on improving land and agriculture productivity, and not so much on uh, on the questions of livelihood, uh, food justice, and food access. Um, the only um, way uh, migration food security uh, are seen as um, as related is through sort of this widely held notion that people migrate only when they are faced with food shortages or food uh, insecurity uh, and this thinking um, uh, stems from the view that uh, which while fading uh, but but still holds sway uh, in academic and policy discourse on migration in developing countries that's you know that sees sort of rural population as as being sedentary who uh, depend solely on on land and agriculture for their food and income needs and if at all they move it is because they don't have any other option um, and this um, 
uh, this sort of distress uh, uh, centric framing uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is is become solidified. It's solidified it's further reinforced in in recent years by um, uh, uh, disrupt disrupting effects of conflict, climate change, and and economic uh, downturns uh, that have uh, uh, intensified hunger uh, and uh, uh, prompted migration in many many uh, developing countries. But Aside uh, from this distress-centric uh, view of this relationship, uh, there isn't really much uh, on on the mutual connections that migration and food security have, despite you know as I said, and their growing significance. Um, uh, and what um, what I argue uh, uh, in in is that while food shortages uh, uh, often act as a catalyst. Uh, uh, for migration, and I think we are seeing, uh, you know, uh, in in various conflicts around us. Uh, uh, at the same time, this account only uh, uh, provides a partial understanding uh, of uh, of this relationship. Uh, and uh, I advance a conceptual framework that considers three broad pathways. Uh, first, of course, how you know food shortages or food insecurity figure in household migration decisions. Uh, second, the role of remittances that migrants send back um, uh, and in influencing household uh, uh, food security outcomes. And third, the, the bearing of uh, uh, gender dynamics uh, that are altered as a result of migration. Uh, and in this talk, I'll focus on um, on the last two uh, pathways, uh, uh, drawing on the research that I've done uh, in India. Um, so briefly, to, to set the context, uh, India suffers from very high levels of food insecurity and undernourishment, despite um, uh, three decades of uh, rapid economic growth. Uh, if you look at F FAO's uh, uh, statistics, one third uh, of the world's um, uh, nearly 700 million pe uh, undernourished people live in India. Now, the government of India uh, contests these figures on account of uh, methodology. But even if you look at um, uh, in Indian government's own surveys, so, you know, you have figures uh, such as 35 percent of under five children being undernourished. So, so there is a problem. Uh, uh, importantly, in um, in India, the role of agriculture as a source of uh, 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 food and income uh, uh, has uh, has diminished uh, significantly. In uh, recent research by IFPRI, points to uh, an agriculture nutrition uh, disconnect. Um, why this is happening is because much of the recent economic growth uh, has been urban centric, uh, and it has uh, uh, come at the expense of rural agriculture sector. Uh, and as a result, uh, millions of rural households in India are transitioning their dependency away from uh, farming, uh, land and farming, uh, uh, to non-farm sources on migration uh, uh, to cities in particular, uh, data from uh, Indian population census, um, and large scale sample surveys and village studies all point to uh, increase in migration, uh, mainly uh, mainly to cities. So, so, so these trends of persistently high uh, food insecurity and uh, rising migration uh, necessitate an understanding um, um, the relationship, uh, this relationship. And um, so uh, to study this, I uh, uh, used a case study uh, approach to generate insights on, uh, on migration food security connection and uh, uh, I my research uh, the primary research I conducted was uh, in focused on one districts in the eastern Indian state of Bihar the district of Sivan this is um, the poorest uh, 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 poorest region of India and also has a long history of of migration um, in terms of my uh, research strategy I used a mixed method uh, approach uh, involving household surveys key informant interviews and in-depth interviews uh, uh, with migrants at uh, at destination so the village household surveys were uh, were conducted with um, uh, 197 households that had 
uh, one uh, or more uh, members who had migrated, uh, 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 which I which I call the migrant household, uh, and uh, and roughly equal uh, uh, number of uh, households without migrants, uh, uh, which which I which I'll call non-migrant households, uh, spread across ten villages uh, in in uh, in that district. And as part of the household uh, surveys with migrants, I also uh, conducted um, surveys with 144 wives of the uh, of the male migrants, uh, and later some uh, uh, unstructured uh, 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 in depth interviews uh, uh, with 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 uh, some of the, some of those uh, uh, surveyed um, uh, respondent uh, and. In addition to that, I also conducted in-depth interviews with migrants belonging to these households in, in cities. So uh, in this presentation, I'll draw on this data, both quantitative and qualitative. And this is um, briefly the methodology, but I'm happy to discuss this in detail in Q&A uh, Q uh, session if, uh, if anyone is interested or if, uh, you know, if there are any questions. So... To now uh, share uh, uh, my findings, so a key feature of migration from rural India has been its uh, uh, semi-permanent short-term nature. However, in the uh, in this uh, fieldwork, in the survey that I that I did, I also found that migration is now occurring for longer duration, meaning um, that the significance of migration in livelihoods uh, is, uh, uh, is is increasing. And as this uh, this data here shows, that um, um, a large uh, number of households, surveyed uh, households, had migrant members who had stayed away in the past year, stayed away for ten months or more, which uh, uh, in some of the recent work that I've done with other colleagues, uh, we call permanent circular migration. Permanent in the sense that now uh, uh, house uh, migrants uh, uh, spend uh, an extended duration away from home, but um, circular um, uh, circular because most migrants return uh, return home. Uh, home. Uh, second uh, important feature of migration was that socio cultural restrictions on the mobility of women meant that uh, migration was predominantly the preserve of women. All the uh, uh, sample migrant uh, uh, households had only uh, male migrant uh, members, and and these. Um, uh, patterns of migration, um, uh, I uh, you know, uh, I show present two pathways um, uh, through which migration uh, may have a potential bearing on household food security outcomes. One, of course, is the linkages that circular migration creates between rural and urban economies through remittances, and second, the changes triggered by a uh, male pattern of migration um, uh, at the household level with the uh, household decision-making falling uh, on women in the absence of men. And I'll present uh, evidence to show uh, these linkages. Uh, but just to give you the profile of the study, uh, study site, so in terms of the broad livelihood uh, patterns, a key feature of uh, this uh, this district that I studied has been high land man ratios. In uh, in 2011, uh, uh, this that's the latest census we have. There were 1,500 uh, people per square kilometer, and as a result, a large majority of the households have exceptionally small uh, land holdings. So in the survey, there were only 10 percent of the uh, of the households that had uh, a, an acre or more uh, uh, of land, which too uh, is insignificant. To derive any uh, any uh, meaningful uh, income gains, uh, although I must say that attachment with land uh, remain uh, strong, and this is one of the uh, this is a very important reasons for household uh, reliance on non-farm uh, uh, sources. This uh, um, this data here, this table shows the average percentage share uh, of income by source among migrant and non-migrant households, and as you can see, that farm income, including the off-farm wages, uh, accounted for only uh, a very very minuscule uh, proportion of uh, total household income. On the other hand, nearly three quarters of um, uh, income of non-migrant households uh, came from rural non-farm sources for migrant households, similar proportion 
um, uh, was um, accounted for by uh, by remittances. And if you combine the rural non-farm and uh, urban incomes, uh, 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 which is remittances, um, the total share for migrant households is about 90%. And migrant households, um, in in uh, on average, had higher uh, incomes than non-migrant households, largely because uh, because urban remittances were or urban incomes were relatively uh, higher than rural uh, wages. And if you calculate the seventy-five percent um, share that comes from remittances of the total income, the the income from remittances alone for migrant households is higher than the total income of non-migrant households. And um, um, uh, and these differences are largely due to the, uh, as I said, income differentials between um, uh, rural and urban areas. And although most of the surveyed uh, households, uh, migrant households, had precarious jobs um, uh, in the urban informal sector, and they didn't really have the employment security, the earnings in urban areas were higher still, which provided the migrant household uh, an advantage, and they fared uh, relatively better. And this graph here on living standard uh, shows these differences, though. So the proportion of non-migrant households in low uh, standard of living category is almost double uh, than the migrant households. And these percentages reverse uh, when you move to high uh, living standard uh, uh, category. Um, and I've talk talked about how um, remittances uh, sort of explain these, uh, uh, these income differentials. Um, but what are the ways in which uh, remittances affect the food security? Of course, the most uh, direct impact of remittances was to provide household with cash to meet their food security needs. Uh, uh, but they also allowed households to invest in uh, their land, agriculture, land and agriculture, avoid distress selling of land. In fact, this was uh, one of the, for several households, this was the motivation uh, behind migration. And in some cases uh, where remittances were uh, higher, they also allowed households to accumulate more land. So, so it was a two-way relationship. Uh, lack of land uh, pushed households to to move in search of uh, urban jobs and urban incomes were in turn recycled into a land and agriculture at origin uh, and remittances in terms of you know its impact on agriculture they provided the household with uh, much uh, needed cash incomes to invest in the in the little land parcels they um, uh, they own uh, and therefore were crucial to uh, sustaining and maintaining uh, uh, the land um, uh, in, in the origin, and more than half uh, of the households who own land reported that they used uh, remittances uh, 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 to boost agriculture production. Um, at the same time, because land holdings were small, investments also tended to be on small head items like uh, uh, buying seeds and fertilizer, paying rents for pump irrigation when uh, monsoon uh, uh, failed. And, and these investments didn't necessarily make um, uh, households food secure, but they did have a positive impact on food security uh, um, um, of, the, uh, of the migrant households. And um, the data here, uh, uh, this graph here compares the uh, migrant and non-migrant households um, on two self-reported parameters of uh, food uh, security. And as you can see, the proportion of households who reported eating meals without vegetables and consuming single meal a day was about 10% lower among migrant than uh, non-migrant households. And the survey also included several other indicators of food security and all uh, measures this relationship uh, holds. Um, similarly, uh, primary evidence on dietary diversity also revealed that uh, uh, while diets of, uh, of most uh, households uh, surveyed lacked the requisite diversity and uh, non-economic factors such as cultural practices also influence uh, influence what food was to be eaten. Um, uh, at the same time, migrant households fared better uh, than the non-migrant households, largely uh, because of uh, uh, better uh, incomes. Uh, um, 
So the broad uh, story that emerges uh, uh, from uh, emerges uh, from from this data um, is that uh, circular migration creates uh, you know uh, important rural urban linkages and remittances have overall positive um, impact on household food security um, uh, of the migrant households. But there is there is more um, uh, to this relationship and another important uh, pathway of linkages as I as I said before is the effects of gender. Um, uh, so there is now an overwhelming body of uh, evidence that suggests that women tend to use household resources in a way that maximizes household welfare and some of it is of course driven by uh, cultural uh, expectation from women but this is also also the fact and even though they um uh, they face widespread discrimination they place household well-being over their own uh, uh, and in the case of india some social analysts have even argued that if a typical rural indian uh, uh, woman was asked about her personal welfare she would find the question itself unintelligible and if she is able to reply she may answer the question in in terms of a reading of the welfare of the family the whole idea of personal welfare may be unviable in such a context. And while that is the case in patriarchal societies, it's the men who control household finances and assets such as land. But uh, migration uh, and male migration that we see uh, uh, in this field side, but also uh, it's a dominant uh, uh, form of mobility in, in, in large parts of India, um, has the potential to alter household uh, gender power dynamics with uh, decision-making household decision making uh, falling in the hands of women while uh, the men are away. And um, um, the field research in all uh, the 10 villages uh, uh, in this district uh, showed that in many families, in the absence of men, women acted as de facto, uh, uh, if not de jure, household head, uh, and hence somewhat dislodging the, the, the strong stronghold of patriarchal norms. Uh, and in the survey, there were 52 percent house migrant uh, house households were headed by women who single-handedly manage uh, their households uh, for the period when their husband uh, were away. And in my interviews with them, many women were also very, very vocal. So to quote one respondent, uh, woman respondent, she told me that our men only bring home money, but we are the ones uh, responsible for managing it and for spending it as wisely and stingily as possible. Besides, we've got a whole lot more of other family responsibilities than, than men do. And um, the uh, the quantitative survey data also confirms um, uh, this. Um, and this graph here um, uh, compares women um, who took independence decision um, on uh, aspects of household uh, uh, welfare, household uh, um, uh, and uh, household affairs. In the, in the presence and absence of their husband. And uh, the, the data clearly uh, shows here that a greater proportion of women participated in the household decision-making when their husbands were away uh, compared to when they were around. Uh, and, and there are also, I must uh, mention, there are also long-term uh, effects in that uh, migrant migration and exposure to cities among male migrants also seems to uh, bring about uh, uh, attitudinal changes among uh, among men uh, on gender norms so and you know this is um, uh, uh, this is what uh, one of the migrant uh, uh, respondent I interviewed told me. Uh, he said that at first I was shocked to see how women in the cities carried themselves. They were so different from the one uh, you know I was familiar uh, with in my village. But honestly, I liked it. And given the the social norms, I may not allow uh, allow my wife to be as modern as an urban woman. But I know she's not. Um, are supposed to be confined to the four walls of the house uh, either. And, and these autonomy effects um, in the absence of men are important, you know, given the fact that now men are away for the large part of the year. Um, and, um, uh, okay, sorry, this is moving. In um, um, insofar as the question of how do um, um, altered household headship and improve women autonomy relate to uh, uh, food security. So, so this migration, uh, gender and food security relationship was not straightforward. Um, 
and there were several uh, uh, variables uh, uh, that affected this uh, this relationship and i looked at the effects of three uh, mutually interlinked factors um, uh, through which gender of the household ha had mediate mediated food security outcomes this included interaction of income and gender with food security women's work participation uh, in cash earning activities and food security and family structure uh, you know whether the family was joint or nuclear uh, gender and food security and what i found uh, was that the autonomy effects didn't necessarily translate into improved uh, food, household food security uh, and you know the outcomes were rather contradictory to what would generally be expected uh, so for example when i look at the uh, look at female headed households by level of income uh, i found that female headed households in high income group uh, tended to spend more on uh, food compared to male headed households in the same uh, uh, group or other yet when it came to food uh, security outcomes households headed by women fared worse than uh, or poorer than the male headed households similarly the relationship between a woman's participation in cash income uh, activities, which is generally associated with their greater uh, bargaining position. Uh, and one and there's a lot of literature on that. And one would expect better food security outcomes was also uh, absent. Um, households where women participated in cash income uh, activities to supplement family income were, were, were poorer uh, and they didn't uh, uh, poorer so here uh, the uh, the remittances uh, that women received were very crucial now just to show how these contradictory outcomes sort of play out through the example of uh, family structure gender and food security so what was very clear um, you know there's a lot of evidence in the survey data and also uh, 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 the, the the related feedback i did is that in the decision making matrix uh, of the of of the household the structure of family played a, a very important role in that women from nuclear households enjoyed greater autonomy than women from joint families where uh, elder uh, members such as uh, you know in-laws father-in-law mother-in-law uh, uh, restricted their control over uh, over on the resources and uh, uh, nu nuclear uh, women headed household also spend more money on food as, as this graph shows so um, the average expenditure on food among women headed nuclear households was about 20% more than men and women headed joint households and 25% more than male headed nuclear households yet when it uh, when it comes uh, comes to food security a large proportion of women headed nuclear households um, uh, reported higher food insecurity than the women headed joint households and uh, and when i compare the women headed household with male headed one by family type similar uh, patterns emerge which show the greater disadvantages the advantage faced by women headed nuclear households who uh, had greater autonomy now how do we um, uh, how to interpret uh, these findings what do these contradictions uh, point to I interpret these uh, results as reflecting gender-based uh, disadvantage that women-headed um, household face. Uh, and this is corroborated also by uh, the qualitative interview uh, data. For example, during the field work, I found that uh, women uh, in the absence of men faced uh, difficulties in accessing the government uh, uh, food ration scheme. Uh, which is very very important in in this part of uh, uh, part of the country, um, and um, and this gender based vulnerability uh, that women headed household make it seems uh, uh, makes joint family structure important where the resources were shared and this is important because many uh, uh, in fact most uh, or almost all uh, the migrants worked in in urban informal jobs and so in times when they were not able to send uh, or remit money home um, the joint families resources came to uh, came to their uh, uh, the rescue and protected them in times of food and income shocks um, um, so um, so uh, to uh, uh, to uh, conclude, um, so migration and food security uh, are playing an increasingly important role. Um, uh, this research shows in in uh, in households' livelihood and and food security, particularly the the rural urban linkages the circular migration creates uh, through remittances. 
um, the impact of remittances uh, on the whole, uh, uh, you know, appear to be positive. Uh, and and this, uh, you know, these connections need to be recognized, uh, uh, recognized uh, in um, sort of the development policy that uh, tends to view rural households moving because they have food shortages. And then the solution often is to provide, uh, provide them with uh, 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 with uh, food-based uh, social protection, but uh, but I think there's more to this story as as this data uh, you know uh, field work suggests. Um, the migration gender food security relationship uh, is a lot more complex in that the autonomy uh, effects don't uh, necessarily and readily translate into better food security um, as would be expected, and gender seems to exert. Uh, negative uh, influence on household food security outcomes and there is uh, and it seems it's because of the gender based disadvantage and there's need to address uh, address uh, understand uh, better understand and address these vulnerabilities we also need uh, uh, given the uh, the outcomes uh, of migration vary uh, uh, across con context we need more uh, primary research to understand uh, uh, this migration food security relationship uh, 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 better. Uh, but what is very clear is that uh, uh, migration is, given migration is becoming an increasingly important uh, part of households, livelihood, and not just in India. I presented the case of India, but there's a lot of literature uh, that it's uh, it's the case in many many parts of the developing uh, countries. There's need to uh, better integrate integrate migration and and, and food security. Um, so this is the book. Uh, uh, if anybody is interested, uh, it's uh, uh, I believe the. Uh, the international version, hardback version is available. Also, you can access it uh, through your library. Um, uh, I'll stop here and uh, you know, thank you. Uh, thank you for your time. Good question. Wow. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Chaitani, for sharing that uh, rich, uh, well of research with us um, a lot of a lot of great insights there a lot of good nuance as well so i'd like to invite uh, uh, participants to please put your questions in the chat function uh, if you have any questions i will direct them to uh, professor Chaitani for you i wonder if i could start use uh, chair's privilege maybe to to get the to get the q a uh, going here um, I was uh, I was really fascinated by some of your findings, and they they appeared to um, you know align somewhat closely with uh, some of the secondary literature that I'm familiar with in Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, East Africa in, in particular, uh, which also seems to suggest that the overall food security situation of a family may or may not correlate with uh, the improved. Uh, condition improved food security of of the mother in the family right the female uh sort of uh, member of the family um and so I, I wonder if in your findings if you could if if this is also something that you've seen um and if you could maybe talk about that a little bit um so the overall food security situation for a family even in a migrant households how does that translate to you know, the food security situation of, um, you know, the woman leading the household. So uh, uh, thank you. I, I think that's a that's a great uh, question. And uh, uh, and that's that's what I find, uh, you know, in this case. Um, and uh, and I think there are several reasons that explain why uh, you see within the households differences in uh, by gender in the in the food security situation. One, of course, is that uh, uh, here you know you have cultural expectation. I think there are cultural norms here in many parts of India where women are expected to eat after you know after men, and oftentimes it's what's left, right? You eat. Uh, but I think, uh, uh, so that's, uh, you know, that's one reason. Uh, but I think here, even in families, another important issue is that, of course, you see um, that uh, uh, women-headed households are now involved in household decision-making. At the same time, when men are not around, it means 
also taking on additional uh, burden of household responsibility, not just the uh, you know reproduct reproductive function, but also household agriculture and so on. So when you're spending more time doing uh, uh, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, spending more time taking on these responsibility you know many many women also so it's not food insecurity is not necessarily because of lack of uh, uh, lack of uh, access to food but it's also because of time poverty right so you know not eating at the right time skipping meals and so on. Um, uh, so I think, you know, there are, uh, 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 and, and of course, the third re reason is that if you look at it by, uh, by the economic status, uh, uh, women uh, who uh, in nuclear families who, um, you know, whose husbands were in precarious urban jobs are not able to send remittances, that makes them even more vulnerable to, uh, to food insecurity. So I think, I mean, I mean, what I tried to present was sort of this, uh, this broad picture, but there are uh, nuances and dynamics, you know, to this larger, larger story. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it does. That's very interesting. Uh, we do have a couple of questions, so I wonder if I can direct them yeah. uh, to you. So the first one uh, is, it's surprising to see that female-headed households spend more on food. Could this be attributed to women typically handling food purchase, purchasing responsibilities and, as a result, being more adept at accounting for all food expenses compared to men, who may only be aware of some of the expenses and thus tend to underestimate it. Um, um, I mean, my my reading was that um, uh, women-headed households they tended to spend more on uh, on things that mattered for household welfare, and food uh, was one of them. Uh, uh, of course, they have, uh, uh, you know, they have greater knowledge uh, of, uh, you know, because they are involved uh, in cooking, particularly in rural India. At the same time, this context, women face a lot of restrictions on their mobility. So they don't really step out of the house, uh, uh, you know, uh, unless uh, the men are, uh, men are not around. So, so I think it's got more uh, uh, more to do with women sort of prioritizing, uh, you know, expenditure that they think uh, matters then, uh, then really being adept at it. Uh, that could also, uh, you know, partly explain. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a couple more. So um, thank you, Dr. Chathani, for the interesting presentation. Uh, I was wondering if you were able to capture any insights on the food security situation of migrants during your in-depth interviews with them at their destination? Yeah, so, uh, no, this is a very, very interesting question. Uh, actually, um, the situation of migrants, while they, um, um, you know, they ensured that their families uh, um, um, have access to remittances that allow them to buy food and, um, you know, become food secure, migrants often um, resorted to consumption rationing. So they spend less money uh, to save more, uh, to send it to family members. So the situation of migrants was actually, if you compare the food security of um, uh, of the households with migrants at destination and um, um, the members uh, in the origin, and the origin um, um, uh, members of the origin had better food security overall. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions here in the chat function that I'll read out to you as well. So the first is a is a question about the about government benefits. You mentioned that the majority of incomes of the migrant households comes from remittances, and for the non-migrant households, they come from non-farm incomes. Of late, there is talk about direct benefit transfers happening from the government to the accounts of beneficiaries. It seems to be quite quite a small portion of their incomes. Do you see an opportunity here for government to increase the transfers to enhance food security? I mean, of course, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, the given the 
uh, uh, food insecurity, the magnitude of food insecurity we have, there is uh, there is a need to do a lot more on the part of government, right? And I think one of the arguments, so we have um, a food safety nets uh, for uh, you know for the for for a very long time they've been targeted, right? Targeted um, um, uh, to uh, households that are you know called below poverty line households, households, um, but uh, uh, many a times the target targeting uh, means that uh, 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 that households who uh, are deserving of these benefits get excluded you know uh, uh, there are a lot of reasons for it uh, because uh, oftentimes the poor and vulnerable and those who do not have the voice right they uh, you know they are not uh, uh, you know they get uh, they get excluded from from these benefits so now the government has um, uh, now we have a, a more uh, expansive, if not universal. So there was, you know, I think a lot of us working in the food security space have been talking about universal food, uh, food uh, based uh, social protection. And uh, now the government provides that um, direct benefit transfers. Um, there was a lot of uh, policy discussion because the food based safety nets that um uh, that india uh, has been operating they uh, you know they are uh, there are huge problems of leakages uh, corruption maladministration and so on so um uh, you know this idea uh, gained a lot of traction uh, when just before the right to food act uh, was passed in 2013 uh but my, um, you know, and I've done research on uh, a, a similar scheme, a coupon schemes uh, in Bihar, um, you know, uh, involving the same research. And, uh, and I think what we argue is that, you know, it's not really the technical fixes, right? The direct direct benefit transfer versus food ration, um, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, they don't, I mean, uh, you have to really understand the political economy of resources and rights. So, you know, uh, the, you know, and the effort should be on empowering the poor. Right, and then you know whatever those so so there is a there is a there's certainly a scope to expand uh, food based provisioning whether uh, you know whether direct benefit transfer is a way forward I am not sure I think in kind food provisioning uh, still makes a lot of sense particularly in remote rural parts of the country where um, you know getting access to the direct benefit transfer would involve a person traveling to two three sometimes four kilometers right so there are uh, those opportunity uh, you know cost uh, whereas the pds shops are uh, you know are there in almost all villages so you have about half a million you know pds shops so i think um, uh, this system of in kind food provisioning works uh, and um, um, but there's this, we certainly need to. Uh, this needs to be. Um, uh, uh, this needs to be supplemented by DBT, right? So there's, there's an additional income, but not necessarily. Um, you know, it's not a question of one versus the other because. Um... Hey, thank you, thank you for a very interesting response. Um, there's a question here that you started your presentation. Um, you know, talking about. Uh, you know the siloization of, of of certain themes. So this is a question of about you know trying to reach across some of these silos. Um, to what extent do non-migrant households benefit from migrant remittances in terms of food security? So in other words, do we need to examine inter-household linkages and social networks plus the circulation of remittances within rural communities? Uh... I mean, I um, so in some of the other research that I have done uh, shows that uh, uh, the remittances seem to um, uh, seem to fuel non-farm, a local non-farm economy. Uh, you know, where you have uh, uh, non-migrant uh, uh, households benefiting primarily. But that's, uh, you know, that's research uh, that that sort of looks at international migration where remittances are higher. So, so uh, I mean, non-migrant non households don't necessarily benefit from uh, migrant remittances, but they do benefit uh, from, you know, the, you know, I mean, there are uh, some, uh, uh, you know, some linkages 
wages and so far the uh, uh, food security of non-migrant households is concerned. So what uh, happens in households where uh, men are not uh, around and women still face cultural restrictions on their, you know, on, on work. So, you know, so land, land uh, is leased out to other uh, uh, other household non migrant households particularly you know belonging to the disadvantaged communities of chiral caste and chiral tribe and that uh, uh, has positive uh, impact some positive impact on their on on the food security of the poor non migrant households mm -hmm. uh, uh, particularly you know in uh, in the context of the food price rise that we see because then they buy a lesser share of uh, or they have to depend on market less uh, uh, because they have some, you know, uh, land, they know that, you know, that uh, they can access, uh, you know, that provides a source of food security. So not really remittances, but the changes that migration triggers in land and agrarian relations. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question here for clarification, uh, Professor. So um, you mentioned that non-migrant um, households have 70% of their income from rural non-farm sources. So where does that income, non-farm income originate? I mean, these are, uh, uh, these are shops. Um, uh, uh, oh, so, it, okay, that, that way it's the remittances, right? That the migrants are sort of injecting, right? Uh, but the point there, what I was trying to show is in, you know, in, in, uh, through that data is that now um, uh, contrary to sort of this popular perception of rural communities being dependent on, uh, you know, in fact, solely dependent on land and agriculture, that is no longer the case, right? And the majority of the cash income certainly comes from the non-farm sources. For non-migrant households, is the rural non-farm, small industry, shops, uh, um, you know, some uh, construction uh, construction work nearby. Part of it is because of the remittances that migrants, uh, you know, migrants sort of inject uh, in, these, in these rural economies. Uh, uh, but, you know, that work is not the rural non farm economy uh, uh, certainly in this part is not very strong um, uh, you know it's very the, the the jobs are not but those who cannot migrate also increasingly depend on the non-farm jobs uh, you know uh, uh, and not really on on food and agriculture I think that's the point that I was trying to make really okay thank you uh, we have a little more time for questions, if there are any final questions. I might actually ask you one. Uh, this is also for clarification. So if I remembered your your one of your slides correctly, you talked about, you know, uh, meals in which uh, households, uh, you know, ate uh, meals with vegetables and without vegetables. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, you know, standard nutritional profile, uh, food profile of a household. Uh, you know what what do households typically consume uh, in this area? Uh, okay, so um, so I think dietary diversity was uh, uh, was a major issue uh, among all households, including the the migrant households who uh, were relatively better off because you know because of the remittances. Um, uh, and in general, uh, uh, the food uh, you know much, you know, much of the source of, uh, you know, food energy was from cereals, uh, you know, it was uh, a macronutrient. So uh, rice, uh, a lot of rice, potato, uh, uh, potato curry, and, you know, they are, um, you know, they're consumed. Uh, but then you had um, uh, the, 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 the changes, uh, but if you look at uh, sort of the 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 dietary uh, profile of migrant versus non-migrant households. Migrant households uh, were better off, and um, uh, what remittances did was you know, small, small changes. So, for example, households having the money to buy or have chicken once a week, right, uh, 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 compared to before when they had it once a month, right. Uh, so, so, I think those changes uh, were there, but then uh, um, um, uh, the dietary diversity was was a major. Uh, issue. I think uh, there were 
30 food items that uh, we uh, that I gathered information on and uh, the maximum uh, for uh, for a few households was like 17 uh, food items uh, or so on uh, or even 12 I, I don't I don't I don't quite have the number uh, so, uh, um, um, so 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 diet di diversity uh, uh, was was a major issue and most households tended to eat just uh, rice uh, and uh, um, um, you know and potato based curry uh, thank you um, I think we have one final question here. So this is a question about the role of rural cooperatives. So, Professor, do you see a role for rural cooperatives of various forms, not just agricultural, to make the lives of people, the people that you came across, better? I um, I don't know um, how to. Uh, I mean, uh, there are uh, uh, agriculture cooperatives uh, run by government. Um, but, uh, or, you know, this is small, but I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think in, in this context, we don't have, but rural cooperatives have worked, uh, you know, for example, in, in Gujarat, you have, uh, milk, uh, you know, based cooperatives, Amul, you know, uh, so I think they, they do work. I mean, but this is a context and, and I think this is much of sort of, um, uh, East and North India, where land holdings are exceptionally small, and um, uh, moreover, uh, farming is coming under increasing uh, stress. Uh, you know, uh, uh, now uh, from climate change and so on. So, so I'm not sure if uh, you know rural cooperatives on agriculture. Uh, uh, would make a lot of difference, really. Uh, I think, um, and, and I think, I mean, that's sort of the you know, if you look at the policy approach to migration to rural development uh, it has primarily been that that you know stop people there stop people in rural areas because they are migrating because they don't have any other options um i think that's not true uh, of course you know a lot of the households are facing distress a lot of the households don't have any other options but uh, i mean this uh, uh, and and you know there is a need to strengthen rural non-farm economy, whether uh, you know whether you do it um, through better non-farm jobs or through rural cooperatives, of course we you know uh, you know that they are needed. At the same time, if uh, uh, if the idea is to just stop people there, I think that doesn't you know that doesn't work. It you know it's never really worked. Uh, um, and and I think I question that policy approach. Um, which has been, um, uh, I mean, um, uh, which has been actually very, very dominant. In fact, even if you if you see sort of the academic and policy thinking on migration, you know, going going back to Todaro, right? I mean, he was um, and the the uh, influential nineteen um, seventies uh, paper uh, on that proposed a dual economy model. I think while he acknowledged the agency of migrants, uh, the idea was to sort of, you know, he also uh, talked about bringing city lights to, um, you know, to uh, uh, the rural places. And, and I think that, uh, I mean, you do it, but not with the purpose of, you know, uh, 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 stopping migration. My sense is that, you know, I think it's uh, because um, in India, certainly, and I think that's, uh, you know, I've been looking at the work of my, uh, and I think in other parts also, uh, some of the work that my food uh, network colleagues are doing, I think um, it's, you know, the in income and employment are increasingly concentrated in, in, in cities, and how do you really uh, make those urban jobs better, how do you ensure that people don't get trapped, um, uh, in, in in urban informal jobs and in in the in, in poverty is really the challenge. Uh, 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 and of course, those who want to stay in rural areas should be allowed to stay. You know, you also need to strengthen the rural economy. So it's a long answer, but you know, I had to. Oh, long and comprehensive answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, everyone, we are at the end of our hour. So uh, it's just left for me to say thank you. Thank you very much to Professor Chaitani for your presentation and presenting us with these wonderful insights today. Uh, thank you as well to the My Food Project for hosting uh, this webinar today. And thank you to all of you who have attended. Uh, we appreciate your participation and your wonderful questions. Um, so until the next time, uh, all the best and have a wonderful day.
Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for having me and thanks uh, thanks for sharing the session. We appreciate it. Thank you. See you, everyone.